the implication is that observation leads to knowledge. The implication is <clears throat> that if you apply a logic to observation, that knowledge has some degree of objectivity. And ultimately, if you make it scientific, <clears throat> then it must by definition be true. Go through that again. What's the word underneath the area on the Science, logic, objectivity. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go through this again. When we think about the whole point of empiricism is that we move away from a kind of theoretical set of assumptions to an understanding of the world that's rooted in experience. The fundamental problem with experience is that without any kind of verification, it becomes highly subjective. The infamous philosophical debate over the question of, is an apple red because I perceive it to be red, and do you perceive red the way that I perceive red, etc. So the argument becomes <clears throat> that while it might appear to be subjective that if we can figure out a set of rules that govern observation, we can in some shape or form verify experience. Make sense? Okay. The verification principle means that there is some objective reality that transcends our subjectivity. There is some transcendental reality or objective reality that transcends our subjectivity. Ultimately, the question will become, all right, so what is that? At that point, you basically end up with two options. Go back to the a priori, or you find structures that render the experience intelligible. The logic gets a bit circular here. The world can't make sense. Unless the world makes sense. And to that last statement, we add in and of itself. That means that the world must be intentionally 
or actually intelligible. For those people who go the intentionally route, this is where deism came in and so-called natural theology. Modern science assumes that however the universe <coughs> was created, it was neither arbitrary nor accidental. So even if there isn't a God, there are natural laws. <clears throat> okay. Makes sense? Thoughts? Comments? Okay. For an equation to be true, both sides must be valid. They're not valid without the constant. And the point that I'm making is, if in fact the universe were intelligible, if in fact there were natural laws, We would not need constants. So E equals MC square essentially says if I take the energy released and I divide it by the mass in some shape or form, that's going to be equal to c squared. So, to me, constants are fudge factors. They make an unpredictable universe predictable. They're the equivalent of putting your foot down on the short leg of the table in a restaurant or a coffee shop so that the table doesn't wobble. Am I making sense? So is that the way of saying that because the universe isn't intelligible that people have to make up these constants so, like the foot factors to stabilize the that's right. On the one hand, you can say that Einstein was right. There is a clear relationship between energy and matter. Yeah. Because he is the variance of God and the logic. Uh huh. Because it can be changed depending on what we do. That's right. And that's why every formula 
has a different construct. So if we pulled the constant out of all the scientific formula, what do we have left? Nothing. A hypothesis. A description of a relationship. And I think that that becomes in a, a really important point in terms of what we're doing. Without a constant. A formula is a description, not a fact. So if we go back to equals mc square, minus the c square, it describes the relationship between matter and energy. <clears throat> but descriptions are not facts. They are descriptions. We can take them to be factual. We can take them not to. A description focuses on the experience, not on the fact. Questions, thoughts so far? That's right. Mm -hmm. And we see where the concept of science break down even more is with the concept of something like a photon. So the debate about light has been, is it a wave or is it a particle? Well, it's sort of both. <clears throat> so my point is that when you push science to its limits, its fundamental assumption about the nature of the world doesn't work. The presence of a constant in a scientific formula reflects the human need for certainty, not the certainty of the universe. The presence of a constant reflects the human need for certainty and truth, not the certainty and truth of the universe. That's what I was thinking. Um, when I say that constant light is the need for certainty and truth, but um, you know, just in a communal setting that a constant is in life, you know, like this is purpose uh -huh. in existence. Uh -huh. Yes. So if we think in terms of why do we need to make a description of fact? It's because there is a fundamental uncertainty that plagues human existence, which humans find profoundly uncomfortable.
So we're back to one of the fundamental points that we've been making since our conversation began, <clears throat> which is that our, our reaction to the world is not logical. Our reaction to the world is emotional. Questions, thoughts so far? Okay. You're good? Okay. As far as I know, the concept of phenomenology is derived from Edmund Husserl, specifically his work, The Cartesian Meditation. It will obviously be picked up by Heidegger and others following the Searle. The focus of phenomenology is to describe to disclose and in terms of what we just said its focus is on the experience not on the fact it acknowledges the potential subjectivity of that description. Depending on whose phenomenology you're reading, there is an assumption that somehow, since the experience is grounded in the disclosure of the world, that the disclosure grounds, and by that I mean is the foundation for the experience. So unless one of us <clears throat> is having hallucinations, we're describing the same world, we live in the same world, we experience the same world, and however different that experience might be, it's still the experience of the world. So questions, comments, thoughts? I'm sort of trying to slow down a little bit today to let some of this sink in. Even more deeper than that, <clears throat> if we were to take away language altogether, go back to the time before the written word. It appears as though humans relied on things like wall paintings. Mm -hmm. 
So if you were to draw a picture of a bison on a wall, I would be able to identify bison from the drawing. And were we both to see the bison, whether you saw it as brown and I saw it as black, there is still something recognizable across all of our experience about the concept of bison. Make sense? So one of the key points of phenomenology, despite Husserl's return to, to Descartes, the Cartesian meditations is a kind of attempted reclamation of Descartes there is still the recognition that the best that we can do is describe. And how do we strip away the logic, the expectations to get back to the foundation of the world? How do we strip away any of the expectations and stand open and stand in the world's disclosure of itself? So if we put it in terms of Kant, keeping in mind that Kant had an, a huge influence on Heidegger, That's right. So if we want to think about the difference between appearance and essence, I think Kant's point is right on. The assumption that you can know the essence of an object implies that the world is intelligible, that there is an essence there to know. In point of fact, we don't know that. We encounter appearances, not essences. We encounter appearances, not essences. For Heidegger, for phenomenology in general, appearances are the disclosure of objects. And presumably that disclosure occur, occurs within the limits of what we call the world or the cosmos but we don't know that there is anything behind it. The appearance is sufficient. So what is the mind-body problem? The mind-body problem, well, if you assume that there is an essence, then you're back to the whole concept of idea or form versus object. So if we go back, the mistake I'm arguing again was that when Plato refers to the so-called theory of forms, he meant it more as a metaphor, not as a theory. But keeping in mind that we read Aristotle reading Plato, With Aristotle, the idea is very clear 
that Plato believed in a dualistic world, the ideas and forms in the physical reality. <clears throat> so when we go back to our conversation about Christianity, when you talk about Genesis and the breath of God being placed into the clay from which Ha'adam is fashioned, that becomes synonymous ultimately with the mind. The soul is the mind. The soul is the place where all those ideas reside. That is the really real, not the physical world. Is that clear? Is that helpful? Okay. So if you remember Kant attempts to bridge this gap, by arguing that the transcendental categories are somehow structures of the mind or brain that are parallel to the structures of the world. It becomes a very effective way of getting around the classic Cartesian problem. It avoids solipsism. It avoids radical objectivity. I'm sorry, subjectivity, and presents us with a tenable argument for objectivity. To be human is to have the transcendental categories somehow implanted in your brain. So ultimately, we should all be able to agree about the nature of the world. Good so far? Okay. But if we go deeper than that, <clears throat> if you recall, Kant said that in the end, the two foundational categories are space and time. Where space describes the relationship amongst objects. And time, their relationship to me. Which is why Heidegger writes a book called Being and Time. The problem with being in time, in terms of how it's read, being and time. Mm -hmm. It is a description. A phenomenology. The only way to understand a description is to experience it. You can tell me all day about your favorite dessert. 
you can describe it in the most fundamental detail. To some extent, vicariously, I can experience your experience. But until I actually eat the dessert, I will never fully comprehend your experience of that dessert. Thoughts, comments, am I being as clear as I can be? Okay. I can't tell you that Heidegger read Darwin or not. And I can't tell you ultimately whether Darwin saw the implications of what he was writing and my suspicion, as I've indicated numerous times in class, is that he did not. But if we think about the argument, and this is in the early pages of that document, if we assume that some of Darwin's analysis is correct, we can start with the point that evolution is a process which moves from simple to increasingly complex. Bracketing the concept of natural selection for a moment, that process is driven by the need to adapt. The more instinctive an organism the less able to adapt. Um, Pardon? Okay. okay, example. Um, an amoeba can't think. Because it can't think, if the water or fluid in which it finds itself becomes too warm, it dies. If it becomes too cold, it perishes. It has no control over its environment. Um, certain forms of monkeys can make tools, but they can't build houses. So what is your question for Okay. The point of this becomes that ultimately the more we adapt, the more our experience of being separate from the world increases. I can't, I'll ask the cats to come to dinner tonight and discuss this with them. That's a joke. I can't tell you that the cats experience a separateness from the world the way that we do. But by the time we get to human evolution, we experience what Fromm calls being a part of and yet apart from. <clears throat> One biologist I once talked to told me that in her mind, humans on the evolutionary scale were most likely to fail. Um, they keep pe peeking in. I'm not sure what they're looking for, but there are people out in the hall. Anyway, 
so the question becomes if from a purely evolutionary perspective why did humans survive and the answer is that rather than react and respond to our environment we manipulate the environment we change the environment to meet our needs We're sitting in a climate control building on a cold, wet, rainy day, and they're comfortable. Now, you could argue that to some extent, <clears throat> when chimpanzees build a nest, they are manipulating the environment. But they're certainly not doing it on the scale that we do it. We bend the world to meet our needs. So the point becomes that from the beginning of human evolution, we are caught in that dichotomy, which Fromm articulates brilliantly in the anatomy of human destructiveness. Diana, thoughts? You look puzzled. No, I'm just trying to piece everything in connection together. Okay. So this in between this becomes the starting point. We never resolve the tension between being a part of and apart from. So the implication from Fromm's perspective is that we really have two choices. Accept it or change it. Fromm's argument <clears throat> is that we spent a lot of time changing it or attempting to change it, but not a lot of time accepting it. So following Darwin, he's going to argue that the primary way that we attempt to define what it means to be human is through the creation of human society. Society provides us with identity. It's our anchor to the world. When we talk about a phenomenology, in some respects, it is neither acceptance nor change. The focus of the phenomenology is the experience of in-betweenness. For humans, silence does not appear to be an option. 
we feel compelled to speak, to engage the appearance of the world. So the argument that I'm making is that if we go back to the concept of myth, it is the experience of in between us. I want to keep in mind that I think Kant had something very valuable to add to the discussion. There were some so-called myths, for example, the latter stages of the Greek pantheon that are rapid departures and profound departures from what we're talking about here. When we talk about the epic of Gilgamesh, the apparent lack of logic in it, when we talk about myth as etiology, the creation of a story that explains how the current situation came to be, then we are between earth and sky. We are closest to the world's disclosure of itself. Comments so far, thoughts so far? In the sense in which I'm using the word myth, being in time is myth. The peculiar difference in being in time is there is no God. I think that one of the fundamental problems with Heidegger and with being in time is that he offers no ground for the description. Here it is, read it, get it, is sort of the way it comes. And that's why I think if we are redesigning phenomenology, then we have to do it in terms of Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, Eric Fromm, evolutionary biology, and the starting point is incompleteness in between us a part of, a part from. And if we put this in context of what Fromm says in the Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, which is totally consistent with Heidegger, we know that we will die. The experience of mortality becomes the exclamation point on the end of in between us. No matter how I might try to avoid the conversation, change the reality, I know I'm going to die. So the origin of angst in this context, if we can even talk about an origin of angst, is that in between us that profound awareness of being a part of and apart from and the paradox of being both and neither that insecurity that radical discomfort that cold terror in the middle of the night The confrontation with death is really the beginning of our species.
So, as we move forward, one of the questions we want to ask is, what does this phenomenology look like? Are we able to integrate Jung, Campbell, evolutionary biology, Eric Fromm, Charles Darwin, and Martin Heidegger? If we start with in between this, how does that change, alter, supplement, I leave the words to you, our understanding of who we are? It's also, I think, important to know that there cannot be a conversation about why. We can only talk about what is. So as I think about it, Heidegger was right. The boundaries are the earth and the sky. The boundary is nothingness. And we need to stay within that limit and not think about what might be or could be on the other side. If God hides on the dark side of nothingness, then any conversation about God is fundamentally irrelevant. Does that make sense? Similarly, there can be no discussion about the laws of the universe. It's irrelevant. We are bound by the experience of being a part of and apart from. Anything that steps outside that conversation is not relevant. I also want to venture to say that if we think further down the road, for example, um, to our conversation about Camus, that in a very deep and a very rich sense, rebellion is not only the dichotomy of yes and no, it is in some fundamental way both a refusal and an acceptance. A refusal and an acceptance of in betweenness. All those things which we as humans so desperately long for are not possible as long as we are between us and stop. On the other hand, there would be no sense to loving in a world in which all that is human dies if we simply accepted that. So one of the questions I want to look at, is it possible to say that the very act of measuring the distance between Earth and sky? is the first act and the most fundamental act of rebellion. I think ultimately that I'm going to want to argue that the answer to that question is yes. We become human. We become aware in the moment 
we measured the distance between Earth and sky. And in that moment, we become inseparable from the experience of in between us. Impermanence, futility, all human emotion is found in the moment that we take the measure between Earth and sky. Thoughts, questions? Helpful? Ashley, you seem to be deep in thought. What's up? I was wondering where you are for um, yeah. Okay. Okay. If we simply accepted it, there'd be no need to measure. There'd be no point. But we do. And we do because we can't accept it. So when we think about Camus argument that in the end Sisyphus knows the stone will fall back down the hill. Sisyphus smiles. We know that we can rebel all that we want we can intentionally, every moment of our life, measure the distance between Earth and sky. I guess part of the irony is that the very act of measuring calls to mind and reminds us that we will die. So it further intensifies the very experience it is supposed to mitigate. It intensifies the very experience it's supposed to mitigate. So so you're saying the recognizing the goal is um, foundation for the other. That's right. That's what I was trying to say. Mm-hmm. So I guess the next step, <clears throat> what we'll do the next time, is we'll review where we are, continue through the document, and pick up, in all likelihood, here. I'm going to continue to edit and clean up the document. Obviously, there were numerous typos, given that it was mostly written on a tablet without appropriate caffeine and I will get subsequent revisions to you, uh, hopefully between now and our next meeting. All right, I'll stop the recording.